Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today I have a pleasure to introduce Piotr Mieczysław Hayas from the Institute of Mathematics of Pol the Polish Academy of Sciences, who will speak about the covariant functor reality of graph algebras. Please, Piotr, Thank you very much, so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, for starters, uh, let me apologize, but again, uh, because audience fluctuates, uh, these are never the same people attending our talks. I will have to go to that, some of you, including myself, one more time, the million of time defining uh, graphs and, and uh, more physical graphs. But I see no way uh, around it. We have to do it so that everybody is on board. But I promise to do it as swiftly as possible, just highlighting the things that will be particularly pertinent to my today's talk. As you can guess from the very title, uh, on 21st of December, we had a talk by Marius Dobolski about the contravariant factor reality of graph algebras. So now we want to explore the other side of uh, the same coin. And basically, I have just one main theorem uh, to present to you. But as I warned you, uh, the introduction will be this, very much the same as it was, for instance, in my conference talk on 16th of January. I cannot avoid. Okay, so now let me switch slides. Um, can you see my slide? Have I started sharing? Can you see the slide? Yes. Okay. The title page. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. So you've seen the title page, uh, and I promise to do it very quickly. That's the same definition of graphs as, as usual. Uh, we have directed edges, uh, which means that we have certain target maps from the set of edges to the set of vertices. Um, and now uh, there is the obvious way of defining uh, a path. So a path will be a sequence of edges uh, such that the end of one edge uh, is equal to the beginning of the next edge. And we view vertices as uh, a path of end zero. So no surprises here. And now I know, I know that it has been uh, spoken about uh, just a few days ago at the conference, but because my talk is about morphisms, let me now do it a little bit less quickly. So the first definition is the really, really standard definition of what is the category of directed graphs. Uh, for instance, uh, there was a very nice paper by Stallings. Uh, he was teaching something in Berkeley, and then he published a paper in Venciones. And he used this category of graph to prove some amazing things in the theory of three groups, if I remember correctly. So, so uh, having this um, combinatorics of graphs at hand uh, is very useful in uh, other parts of mathematics. Okay, and, But he used, this is what I remember vividly, he used this standard category of graphs. The most obvious one, uh, where, where you basically uh, can think about it, okay, like people did it this way. The standard homomorphism of graph is just a map from the space of finite path of one graph into the space of finite path of the other graph, but in such a way that it preserves the length of paths, okay? Which basically means that you uh, uh, map edges to edges, vertices to vertices, and then uh, you know how you, what you do with paths because you chop paths into sequence of edges and to each edge you find another edge so you, you obtain a path of, of the same length, okay? And that's different only. Obviously here you can, you can this pair of homomorphisms induces, um, uh, induces a, a map from finite path to finite path that preserves the length. And of course, if you have a map from a finite path to finite path that induces, that preserves the length, it will give you such two maps between the set of vertices and the set of edges <clears throat> respectively. Okay, and what is what is uh, important to us is, is, is you know, that the source, that, that these morphisms respect the beginnings and the ends of edges, okay? That's why we are mapping paths into paths, okay? Uh, but now we have to go uh, beyond it, and I will show you our motivating example. I, I recall our old theorem with uh, Tobolsk and Kirvasito. Um, and and uh, that, that's just too conservative. So we had to go beyond it, and uh, we defined something which I baptized as, as a path homomorphism of graphs. And now it is again a map from finite paths of one graph to the finite paths of, of the other graph, uh, which satisfies these three conditions. You must map uh, vertices to vertices. Here, there is no leniency. That's strict. I mean, it cannot map a vertex into a positive length path. Of course, and before this map has to respect the beginnings and the ends of path. Okay, so I have some obvious commutative diagrams. 
Uh, and uh, finally, it, it behaves like a homomorphism. So if you have if you have two paths uh, that uh, can be composed into into another path, so P, the end of P is equal to the beginning of Q. So PQ is a path. Then F of such a path is the same as F of P uh, combined with F of Q, right? And because F preserves the ends and the beginnings, FP is again a path. Okay. So, so you can you can think about it uh, uh, in the following way. If you think about the graph as a small category, if you think about um, vertices as objects and about paths as morphisms, then this F can be good as a functor you know, from one small category to another. That's just to, to, to remember what we are talking about. And at a certain moment, it is important. Maybe I should have deleted it because this is this is definitely important when you study the contravariant. Uh, from the reality of graph algebras. Uh, here, I, I guess we don't need this assumption of properness that uh, some maps are finite to one. So, yeah, you, know, you can ignore these things. Okay. Uh, now, that's something which was not in my talk uh, on Monday, uh, 16th of January. Maybe I can shift it a little bit. Yes, so that you can see all my writing. Uh, okay. Um, uh, what is a path algebra? This is a very um, standard construction. Uh, it's uh, as common and popular as, say, the tensor algebra. And it has some universality. So many things that you construct, you construct by dividing path algebras by proper ideas. And, and in fact, uh, Levy path algebras, graph sister algebras, you can think of appropriate quotients of path algebras. Okay? So this is a very good uh, starting point. Uh, the definition that I would adopt here is, is uh, very simple. Uh, I take uh, the space of all finite paths in my graph E, and I take all maps from set critical maps from the space into some ground from K, and I demand that these maps are finite support. Okay. And uh, uh, then I define um, so the addition and scalar multiplication are pointwise. This is obviously a vector space and each finite path is a basis element okay for this vector space uh, so, so now i i define uh, it is also very clear that, that uh, the basis of such a vector space is given by these um, kind of direct delta functions characteristic functions so uh, if i take a map uh, chi p so p is a path and this is a map from the space of finite paths to k is defined as follows chi p of another path q is equal to one if p is equal to q and zero otherwise so this is just you know support uh, a map uh, the correct map uh, or to some direct delta and this is obviously a linear basis uh, of um, the path algebra so we understand it as a vector space um, and now we can use this basis to define the multiplication. So all we need to, to have a multiplication, we need an associative bilinear map from Ke cross Ke to Ke. Um, and here the definition as follows, that this bilinear map uh, on the basis is given as follows, uh, M of chi P chi Q is equal to chi P Q if P and Q can be concatenated and zero otherwise, okay? So that's uh, that's a very uh, natural uh, definition, and uh, what you have to prove is that the thus uh, given defined by linear map, it's by definition by linear, that it has associativity properties. It's a very boring calculation, but you do can do it. Okay, and thus, but it's not really true in general. No, 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 no. I, we will address it uh, later on, but let me uh, since you asked, let me reveal to you what happens right now. Basically, path algebras, on path algebras, Levit path algebras, grass sister algebras, all of them are unital if and only if you have your set of vertices is finite. Yeah. And then your unit is simply uh, the, 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 the sum of all kinds uh, labeled by your vertices. And it's a finite sum because you assume that the set of all vertices is finite. Otherwise, these algebras are non unital. It's if and only if. Okay? These are nice exercises, and it, work, it works at all the levels because basically, we have this higher. We start with the path algebra, then you go to the path algebra of extended graph, then you open it into the con path algebra, then you open it to the Levit path algebra, and then you complete it to the universal sister algebra, which is the graph sister algebra. Okay, so that, that, that's somehow it, it, it's very systematic. Okay, 
<laughs> so I already mentioned extended graphs, and this is very important in, in all these con Levit and graph sister algebras. Um, basically, what happens is the following: you take your graph, it's any graph that you have, and to every edge you have to assign a ghost edge. So the ghost edge of an edge is an edge which goes in the opposite direction. So uh, more formally speaking, what you do is the following. You define the extended graph uh, in such a way that your set of vertices is the same as before. So E0 bar is equal to E0. But now uh, your E1 bar, the set of all edges in the extended graph, is the disjoint union of edges that you already have and uh, another copy. And to distinguish them, we, we put the star over there. But now we have to uh, define the sort and target maps to, to make it all uh, work properly. And uh, you, you change nothing on, on the edges that you have. But when you look at, at, the, at the source of, um, of, of uh, the start edge, the ghost edge, the, the source of this edge is equal to uh, the end of uh, the edge before you start it. And, and the, the end of the star is equal to the beginning of it. So as I told you, just reverse the orientation, OK? So, so if, uh, if uh, uh, this is your edge E, then this is your edge E star, OK? And, and, and we are now considering only such graphs. But in order to avoid the cluttering of all that stuff with uh, these double arrows, uh, it's very convenient to, uh, to draw, say, just this uh, graph, say, the dependent graph. And I drew only two edges. But if I would like to look at it as a path algebra, I would have to add two ghost edges um, to have this picture of a path algebra. Okay. Well, then I have a question. So, go ahead, Adam. Uh, yes, so if you adjoin all these ghost uh, edges, uh, you uh -huh. also mentioned you view your graph as a small category. So in this way, you obtain uh, what? Uh, you adjoin the inverses of these arrows? No, 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 no. These are by no means inverses. No. Mm. No, that's very important. Okay. Don't think, uh, of course, graphs and algebras are very much related to group points. This is definitely the case, but uh, don't think about it as a small, you know, group point is a small category. Yeah. That's definitely not the case here. He starts by no means an inverse. I mean, these guys are partial isometries to B, and partial isometries are by no means unitaries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, the compositions, E and E star. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, what's the composition E and E star? Uh, well, in order to, to, to it's, it's, it's the, the composition of E and E star is is the same uh, as uh, well. I mean, here this is the definition of a graph, so I cannot talk about the composition. But uh, of course, as as you can guess, uh, you, you 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 can take the path algebra of the extended graph, and this is what we will be doing. Okay. And if you have, say, uh, um, X and Y star, okay, and you wonder what it is, then you must have that the end of X. Yes, so, so, so I assume that, that, that things fit. Yeah, you must have that the end of X is equal to the beginning of Y star, so, but, the, but the beginning of Y star is the end of Y. So basically, you can multiply to something non-zero uh, X and uh, Y star if you don't leave X and Y uh, have the same end. Uh, okay, Piotr, once again, x, x star, what is it? Just a loop? Oh, oh extra yes, loops or what? Yes, and this, exactly, yes. Uh, so, so, so uh, the, 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 let, let me see if, if uh, you, you, this is not zero. x, x star. So, so, so x, x star, okay. Uh, so, the, what is the beginning of x star? The beginning of x star is the end of x, so the end of x is equal to x star. So, so, so this is non-zero. This is just a loop, exactly as you said. Uh, you go by x, and then you come back by x star, exactly. So and you course, add a loop to every uh, yeah. edge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you okay. have a loop at every edge, and in fact, right. in, in fact, of course, it also works the other way around. It's, it's a loop just with different orientation. Because, sure, sure, sure. Because now the sure. end of x star is the beginning of x, so they can be compatible. They have two loops going this way or the other way, but they are not. Yeah, but the loops at different points. So exactly, exactly, they start at different points. This is one. Yeah. It's okay. In this path algebra, they are non-zero. They're elements of your basis. Okay. 
uh, what elements of your basis? Well, every path gives you a basis element. Again, the algebra, yeah, yeah. So yeah. linear basis, yeah. So, yeah. so. that's by construction. Okay. So do you want this, this loop to have uh, an item potent quotient in some regions? Yes, later on we will we'll, we'll quotient that. At this stage, it's At this stage, it's free. free. Exactly. exactly. So, so what we will do later on, we will shrink loops x star x into an importance. Yeah. But in order to shrink x x star loops, we will have to see all loops coming out of a given vertex. Okay, so that's much more complicated. But, but we will do some shrinking of these loops that's provided by the configure relations. Okay. But before we go there, uh, okay, so that's first quotient. Okay, that's the first quotient. Uh, what is the compass algebra? Well, this is the path algebra of the extended graph. So I'm taking the path algebra, but of the extended graph, okay, and I divide it by the ideal generated by these relations. Okay. Right. So, so, so basically, what I'm saying that if E and F are different, then chi E star times chi F is zero. In the, and when E and F are the same, that's exactly what Richard was asking. What to say x, x x star x? Well, then x star x is just uh, the point at which uh, x ends. So if, if we go back to this uh, loop picture. Uh, I'm, I'm having this say uh, e uh, no 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 I should use this one. So now the loop for e star e becomes an item order. Exactly. 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 So e star e is equal just uh, the end of e. So if you want the loop which goes like this, first I go back by e star. So I started here, and then I I, I follow by e. Okay. So this loop. Is shrink to this beginning point. Okay. That, that by this relation, right? Okay. Uh, but now we go one step further. Uh, we uh, also quotient by the second configure relation. So now that's, that's the opposite order, right? Now we are talking uh, E star instead of E star V. But for starters, we restrict our attention only regular vertices and regular vertex is uh, we say that the vertex is regular if and only if it's not a sink so it means that it emits at least one edge and it's not an infinite emitter so it emits finitely many so a regular vertex is a vertex which emits finitely many non-zero edges that's it this is a regular vertex it's very important and you can see why it is important because when you look at this sum here, the sum is non empty, finite non empty. So, so that makes per perfect sense. Uh, so now, if you want to look at it uh, at the picture, and yes. say that, that you have two, two for the sake of, of making it simple, say that I have just two edges here, there, okay, uh, coming from a given vertex. I have a regular vertex and say that it emits uh, E and that it emits F. Okay, so so now I go by E and come back by the star. So that's my first loop. But then I also go by F and come back by F star. That's my second loop. And the sum of these two loops is now collapsed to this origin. Okay. So you see, you cannot collapse just uh, E E star, no. You have to add and then you collapse. That is relation. Okay. Right. And this gives you by definition uh, the Levitt path algebra. And now it's very. Just make sure. Yes. When you say the zero edge, I mean, it's just a vertex. Yes. Okay. Yes. Zero language. Why can't I erase it? Just, just make sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is... You have some horrible delays. Uh... <laughs> All I'm trying to do is to erase it. And look, <laughs> I, I, I made some bubbles. All, all of that should be vanishing, you know? I don't know. Maybe I'll just uh, <laughs> do it like this. I know it's cheating. But... Okay. And now we have a very beautiful definition of a graph C through alpha. So for starters, we take our ground field, 
to be the field of complex numbers. It's not a surprise, okay? And uh, uh, now what we do, we take uh, the extended graph of a graph E, we take, uh, oh, actually, well, it's all the building into the definition of the Lenin-Pav algebra. So I take the Lenin-Pav algebra of a graph over the field of complex numbers, and uh, I define the star structure as follows. I say that all ties labeled by vertices are self adjoint and I say that uh, uh, there is one equation missing. I should get it. I say that uh, uh, chi e star is chi e star, as written here. So star in chi e is the same as having chi on e star, but it doesn't follow. <laughs> I'm sorry, there's a typo. I have to correct it. Now, you also must write, because it's logically independent, that chi e star, star is equal to chi e. Okay, so, so with this, this Levin Pav algebra of a complex number becomes a star algebra. And when you have a star algebra, you might try to take the universal enveloping sister algebra. And here uh, you have a proof, so, so what you do, uh, you cook up representations and uh, uh, you prove that the universal sister algebra exists. Then you prove that the Levit Pav algebra sits injectively in uh, this universal sister algebra. And this is a very nice situation because, on one hand side, we have a representation which is faithful. Uh, and, and, uh, and at the same time, the sister algebra, even by this faithful representation, is exactly the universal sister. Okay. So this is a very regular situation. Uh, and in my opinion, that's the best, the cleanest definition of the graph sister algebra you might have. I mean, for those of you who know the subject, that's not the way people typically define uh, graph sister algebras, uh, because there is, a, there is typically a, a, another condition which is uh, added here, uh, not to believe a condition, but we have an infinite emitter, but for an infinite emitter, uh, you have always for any edge emitted, you have x, x star, which is obviously a projection, but it's a sub-projection of this vertex projection at which x originates, okay? But you can prove in full generality for any graph whatsoever. So for any of you that attended my uh, lecture course in CISA, I, I proved it with all the details that uh, this condition is, is uh, in fact tantamount uh, to, to, to the condition that is only built in, into this coming from the path algebra. You see, among power algebra relations, you must have that, that the beginning of x times x is equal to x, okay? And you also must have that, that x times the end of x is equal to x. So these are, these are very fundamental. I, I don't know why there is such a delay I'm writing, but uh, it doesn't appear. That's very frustrating, but it's it's just um, internet technicalities. So, um, okay, you just have to imagine. I wanted to write x t x is equal to x. I don't know why it doesn't write. I mean, it should write, but the delay is so huge that it doesn't. Okay, and and one of these uh, two conditions I don't remember which one is actually equivalent to this sub projection solution. Okay, so because we define uh, uh, this as universal developing uh, sister algebra, the Levit Pav algebra, and the Levit Pav algebra is defined as the quotient or a quotient of um, the Pav algebra of extended graph, these relations are built in. Okay, uh, whereas typically when you define graph sister algebras, yes, you have um, edges and you have vertices, you have these conscrete relations, but the only thing you say that is that. Uh, Vertices uh, give you um, mutually orthogonal projections, but but that doesn't follow as you have to put in later on. But but instead of putting this in, uh, they write the spectral condition. But I much more prefer this definition. Okay. Okay. So uh, now let me get to the motivating uh, example for, for the whole story. As I wrote. Yeah, sure. Good question. Sure. Is the construction of a faithful representation witnessing um, the, the faithful representation of your limit? Yeah. As algebra of the extended graph? Yeah. Is this representation concrete? Yes. Yes. It represented, for example, on the 
small L2 of the pattern space. Of yeah, something like that. It's very complicated. You can find it in this book, uh, Levit Path Algebras, the Springer book. And uh, yeah, I mean, you, you you have a whole chapter devoted and it's spelled out. You, you first construct mm -hmm. different spaces and then use the verb. Hmm? Does it make sense to talk about the reduced version? No, because here sort of is like max and reduced of the same. Okay. Yeah, this is what I tried to, to point out at the beginning. Yeah. It's just like, I don't know, some amenable group uh, and, and, uh, and, and the reduced sister algebra or the max sister algebra are the same. Yeah. So, so, so here, this is something very, very regular. When you have a Levitt path algebra, it's just a dense star sub algebra of the universal enveloping sister algebra. So it exists. And this dense uh, thing, the levy sits injectively there. There's nothing you have to coax it by. Okay. Yeah. So, 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 and the norm that you have in this faithful representation for the levy is, ex is equal to the universal norm. The algebra generates is already universal. Yeah, exactly. It's always the case. It's, uh, it's always the case. So, absolutely enigmatic. But of course, as you can imagine, the construction of the Hilbert space, proving all that stuff, this is like, you know, 20 pages, right, uh, in the book. But this is completely uh, standard. Okay. And, and uh, right, so I just answered your question. So now let me uh, remind you this motivating example. I really hope I can invite that. Okay, let me try. So, so the graph is algebra over here. That's just the minimal unitization of compact operators. I'm writing, but it doesn't appear. This is very frustrating. I guess I didn't. Uh, so see how about this one. Okay, it will be, but this vanish is too fast. I don't know why this writing property doesn't work. I mean, I can see that it reacts. Okay, now. So the graph sister algebra that you have over here, that's just the minimal initialization of compact operators which uh, we also know is nothing but the sister algebra of a standard Polish quantum sphere. So maybe I'll write slowly and then it will be able to follow. Oh, sorry, this should be. You see, our technical problem is that our super duper digital whiteboard is hooked up to a very lousy computer. The computer is a very small processor. So. I, I wouldn't blame internet here or even Zoom, although it's very convenient to blame everything on Zoom. Okay. So that is Easter algebra over here, right? And uh, now, well, obviously, when you have just uh, one vertex, the sister algebra is just complex numbers. It doesn't come as a surprise. Well, for those of you versed in graph uh, Easter algebra, uh, you know that that's the Teptitz graph. So here we'll have the Teptitz algebra. And if your graph is just one loop, then it's sister graph sister algebra is just continuous functions on the small. Okay. And here I have a full back diagram. Uh, here's just the unit map. You put complex numbers by the unit into the integral sister algebra. That's the simple map, which you all remember from high school. From the Teptitz algebra to, to, to the circle algebra. Uh, well, here that's, uh, you see, this sister algebra is the minimalization, so it has a character. You just evaluate this character, which is given to you by minimalization. That's, that's your, your only classical point. So that's the evaluation map at the North Pole, if you want. Okay. And here's a slightly more complicated map, but yes, it exists and you can write it down, okay? And already published knew it that uh, you have a pullback diagram like this, and that his sister algebra can be written as the pullback sister algebra over here. Now, all of these guys happen to be graph sister algebra, all four of them. Uh, so it would be nice uh, to, to, to view this pullback diagram as coming factorially from some morphism of graphs. And when you look, at the left upper arrow and uh, the right down arrow. Well, basically what, what happens uh, over here is that uh, we are talking about subgraphs, okay? A point is a subgraph here, 
the circle is a subgraph in the Tetris graph, and these are all these admissible subgraphs, and in the contravariant manner, as was explained by Magus Tobolsky some time ago, in the contravariant manner, you, you get uh, these C star homomorphisms, okay? So, so there is natural potent construction you have here from, from having an admissible subgraph in the graph, that's the symbol map, and, and here it's just the evaluation, but it's easy, easy to check. Uh, well, um, but how about these maps? Unique map, and there's more complicated map going from uh, the podless sphere sister algebra to the tetrad Okay. Um, uh, yeah, they in fact are induced in the covariant manner. Well, there is not much to do over, over, over here. You map this vertex into this vertex, and that's it. This is your unique map. You, 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 when you put this uh, covariant functor into here, that, that's nothing but the unit map. But, but here it's, it's more complicated. If you, if you really want to unravel, I mean, you have this concrete map from the minimalization of compact operator of tepid algebra. You have a natural map, okay? Uh, that gives you a perfect diagram. And now we want to interpret it in terms of the underlying graphs, okay? And uh, you realize that in order to achieve it, uh, you should uh, follow. Uh, the following recipe. Uh, of course, vertices go to vertices, nothing changes, but what do you do with this countably infinitely many edges? Okay, so the first edge, you map into this edge. The second edge, you map into the path, which is going around the circle and going out. That's the second edge. The third edge, you map into going twice around the circle and then going out, and so on and so forth. So you, 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 you map this countably infinitely many edges, into countably infinitely many finite types, right? And it, it, it turns out that, and, and this you can really easily check, but this is at half homomorphism as I defined it, okay? And then you very easily check that, that uh, the, the, this um, covariant um, construction will induce uh, uh, a star homomorphism, which gives exactly this. But you see, this is something very crucial. Uh, there is no natural morphism here that would preserve the length of the length of paths in order to induce this natural map over here. So this was our motivation in order to, to have such natural uh, pullback diagrams. And um, maybe I should say why I find them exciting, because uh, in classical topology, what you would have over here is that you have such a pusher over, I should uh, use a uh, pen. Uh, so here you have your disk. Here you have a boundary circle included in your disk. Here you have a point, and here you have a sphere, just the two sphere. Okay. So basically, and, and say so you take this point as the north pole, okay? When you look at this push-out, what, what is happening here that I take my disk and I shrink its boundary circle to a point to get a sphere. And this works the same in the quantum world because I take my Klima-Glesiewski quantum disk, which is given by the Tetris algebra, and this pullback diagram simply uh, tells me that uh, I'm shrinking the classical boundary of the Klima-Glesiewski quantum disk with the published quantum sphere. So this is very natural in uh, non-commutative topology. It, it is not an artificial example. It is not that we want to generalize some things and now we have path from homomorphism of graphs. No, I mean, it, it all started from the natural examples which we want to understand um, in terms of graphs, okay? And uh, then some time ago with Alex Kirvasitu and uh, Marius Topolsky, uh, we proved uh, uh, this uh, theorem. Uh, it has lots of you know technical assumptions. I don't want to explain uh, all of this. But uh, what I just want to highlight is uh, that um, this motivating example allows us to formulate a general theorem. In fact, we have a much more general theorem than this, but I don't want to go into it, okay? You, 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 basically, there is no need that uh, you are working in the realm of graph structures. You can boost it up, okay? But that would be too long, too complicated to explain, and it was done at some other talk, so I don't want to repeat it. Mm, uh, okay, so when you look, here at this part, 
This is just the contravariant construction. Simply F1 is a admissible subgraph in E1, so you have a natural uh, C star subjection. The same here. F2 is an admissible subgraph and in, in, in F2, and that's it. Uh, if you contravariant, you use a star homomorphism in there. Okay, but now, uh, motivated by examples like this one, uh, we, we, we also, we're now comparing the graphs F1 and F2 and E1 and, and, and E2. And uh, here, what we are able to write down, uh, we are able to write down, uh, we assume actually that the vertices of uh, E1 and E2 are the same, and vertices of F1 and F2 are the same. And we simply, with some conditions on path homomorphism of graphs, uh, we could say that uh, if we have here path homomorphism of, uh, from E1 to E2, satisfying some conditions, and then path homomorphism from F1 to F2, satisfying some conditions, uh, and then you now induce covariantly a star homomorphism and you have a pullback diagram, which includes the previous example, but it also includes uh, a whole number of more complicated examples. Uh, so here, instead of a tap, it's uh, uh, sister algebra, you have, a, you have a one thing extension of the Kuhn's uh, sister algebra of two. And I like this example because it shows that you can do your non commutative topology over completely quantum spaces. But as O2 is a very famous uh, simple sister algebra, uh, so that's something purely quantum, there is no classical interpretation, and, and you can collapse something very quantum in your quantum space to a point and, and get another thing. So that's exciting. There is nothing the same as the podlash, but, but, but you obtain it by squeezing something else somewhere else. Okay. Uh, but again, uh, our theorem works here. Um, now, uh, you have another very natural topology, very natural example. Uh, that's the, the graph of equatorial Podlish uh, uh, quantum sphere. So, so basically what I'm doing here, I'm gluing two Klimek-Lesniewski quantum disks over the boundary circle. And then I'm shrinking this boundary circle to a point, okay? So as you should expect what happens when I do it, I should get two Podlash quantum spheres attached to one another. And that's exactly what happened. Okay. And uh, also, well, we can have the, the CW complex structure of the Wachmann Sorbonne quantum complex projective spaces. And uh, here, what, what, what we collapse, uh, we collapse uh, 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 inside a four-dimensional function minus key ball. Uh, we uh, collapse uh, in, uh, its, its boundary to S2. So this is S3. So this is S3, quantum S3. Well, it's also SCP2 if you want. This is a four-dimensional ball. That's the standard Polish quantum sphere. And this is CP2Q. Okay, so, so what happens here is that, but I take the boundary uh, three sphere in the four ball, I squeeze it into the two sphere, that's just the standard hot vibration thing. And uh, this way I obtain CP2, CP1. That gives me CDM the complex structure. And of course I can do it in one dimension, it's just for the sake of drawing a nice picture. I took uh, n equal to 2, but you can do it for n, n, right? And again, that this is a pullback diagram follows from our theorem. I'm mean, sorry, when I apply the sister algebras here, I have a contravariant induction, there I have a covariant induction, then uh, I have commutative diagram uh, sister algebras and star homomorphisms, and uh, these uh, morphisms between graphs started by assumptions of our theorem, so by our theorem, I have a pullback sister algebra, okay? So that's an application. This, this is the motivation, and that's old stuff. I mean, we did it a long time ago. But then uh, during the pandemic, uh, I was teaching a lecture course at the University of Warsaw, and uh, I wanted to do everything very, very systematically. And I wanted to understand what would be sort of the most uh, general, the most relaxed set of assumptions allowing us of a covariant induction of a star homomorphism from a path homomorphism of graphs. So here we, we, we had some of this theorem is pretty uh, general, but, uh, but it involves a pullback theorem. 
But now forget pullback theorem. I just want to know what is the, the most general way to induce covariantly a star homomorphism from a path homomorphism of graphs. And that's the main result. Of it. Okay. And I'll try to do it very systematically. You may have this layer, path algebra, a con path algebra, Levit path algebra, graph sister algebra. I'll do it layer by layer and see what other assumptions I have to throw in in order to make sure that my path homomorphism of graphs induces a star homomorphism of algebra. Well, it uses homomorphism of algebra. Okay. And then when you go to, to, to graphs sister algebra, they do exactly a, a star homomorphism. Okay. So first, I have to assume, even to have an induction at the level of path algebras, I have to assume that uh, my path, uh, path uh, homomorphism of graphs are injected when you shift to the process. And this is completely obvious because in the path algebra, uh, you say that your vertices uh, label mutually orthogonal idempotents. So, of course, you cannot glue mutual orthogonal idempotents. That would be a, a contradiction. Right? You cannot keep things that multiply to zero and, and, and multiply themselves to themselves. That's obvious why you have to have injectivity, and there's no way around it. You cannot glue vertices. Okay. That's, I call it condition C1. And that's something I really, really would like to uh, concentrate on today. Uh, this is N for mo monotonic. Uh, this is the second covariant condition, and that's what we did differently in our paper with uh, Alex and Mark. You see, in our paper of Alex and Marius, we assumed, because it was sufficient for our purposes, we assumed uh, uh, this for paths, okay? So it's okay, if for any path PQ, I have an F of P less or equal to F of Q implies P equal to Q, that's our condition. But that condition is too strong. We have natural uh, uh, examples, which I will explain, uh, where this condition is too strong, so we have, to, uh, I decided to relax, okay? And I relax it in the following way, I said that uh, uh, sort of the, the second covariant condition C2 is satisfied if you have the following implication. Whenever you take any two edges, E and D prime, in your graph E, so, so F is this path homomorphism from graph E to graph F. So in other words, it's a map from FPE to FPE. Okay? I take an edge in E and I take an edge E prime. Okay? Now F of E is a path in F, F of E prime is an F path in N. Okay. Now this uh, inequality means that the path on the right extends to the right, the path on the left. Okay. So 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 uh, I can say that uh, E is less equal than Q by definition, if and only if Q can be written. As p times whatever. Yeah, again, this doesn't. It's too slow. <laughs> but we bought it by the extent. Uh, extent that p to the right, not to the left. Okay. So first, uh, it's, it's, uh, no, I don't know. That's so frustrating. Q equals p times whatever w. Okay. So this means that there exists some path W, so that following path P by the path W will give you the path. This means that P is less than okay. But it's important that W is on the right, not on the left. T is the initial statement of this. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So whenever you have that F of E prime, the path of E prime extends the path of E, then sorry, but in fact, these two paths are equal because these two edges are equal, okay? That, that, that's a very important assumption. And this assumption is cooked up, as I will show you, this assumption is cooked up exactly uh, to ensure that the first constraint relations, the constraint relations defining the contra algebra are satisfied. Okay. Now let's try to erase it. And now I have a regularity condition, which, as you can guess, is tuned to make sure that the second configuration relations are satisfied, so that we have a morphism on the level of level graph algebras and graph sister algebras. And uh, uh, well, uh, it's it's of course you can um, prove everything step by step, but it will take too long. So today I decided 
to prove things related to the condition C2. So I'll show you that it's indeed a category and I'll show you that indeed it preserves the first conspiracy relations. Okay. Then you can do exactly the same uh, with the third condition. Okay. Uh, but it's more complicated. Also, let, let me uh, mention that here, uh, the whole difficulty was to invent this condition. This condition is custom designed to make sure that the second constraint relations are satisfied. So the moment you have this condition, is like you climb the right, uh, the right hill and then you just slide down the hill by gravity. You don't need to make an effort, okay? Of course, you still have to be careful with steering. You can fall down. Uh, formally speaking, to write this proof is quite complicated, but there is no idea in it. The idea is to have this condition. Once you have this condition, uh, and then proving that uh, it has the right properties is sort of algorithm. It's just sliding down here. Okay? And I was explaining it at my uh, conference talk, but uh, maybe it's worthwhile just to very, very briefly uh, say it again. Uh, the, the basic idea is as follows let's say, if in your graph E, at the regular vertex, this condition concerns all the regular vertices, okay? You have two edges. And then you need not to map it as you have it in the old category, the standard category. You need not to map it to, uh, to again, two to edges, okay? Because you here have your vertex V, uh, here you have your vertex F of V, it's again regular, of course. Uh, and, and now in, in uh, the standard definition of uh, the category of graphs, uh, in order to, for things to make sense, to 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 to, to have uh, path homomorphisms that preserve the length of graphs, that basically the only thing that would be allowed. If you have n n edges emitted at a regular vertex v, then you must have n edges emitted at a regular vertex uh, f of v. Okay. Okay. Let me make it three to to make it uh, easier to draw. So say that I have three vertices. So what I'm saying is that I don't have to draw the third edge. I might also say that I take one of these two edges and say that at, at the end point of one of these two edges is also a regular vertex which emits exactly two other edges. So then I map these three edges into these three finite paths. Okay? The only assumption is that whenever you start something from your regular vertex, you start some edges, you must take all edges into the picture. And you can immediately see, I mean, I'm not saying it's a proof, but it's the gist of the proof, all right, that, that the second configurations are satisfied. Because imagine that you, that you, 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 you have a sum, uh, say, PP star of all these paths. Well, first, you, you, you look at these two paths, then you, you'll, you'll have a, a common part which you can uh, pull out. And you basically have uh, this uh, this guy uh, times this guy star, but the second guy times the second guy star. This they, they will add up to this uh, vertex, okay? And and then you you'll, you'll have this guy this guy star plus uh, uh, this guy this guy star, which will uh, add up to this vertex, and that's exactly all you need, okay? So it's the very nature of a second configure relation that you must have such a construction. So so the only difficulty was to formulate it like this. But the proof is obvious. But when it comes to the C2, I'm not saying that it uses some uh, ultra smart fix, but, but uh, it requires a proof. And, and I have like four slides proving uh, things related to C2. Right? All right. So now, um, once we have these uh, three covariant conditions satisfied, uh, we can claim that there are some morphisms covariantly induced. So if the only condition that is satisfied is this first covariant condition, the injectivity condition, and as I said, uh, then such a path homomorphism of graph induces uh, exactly in the way spelled out over here. So you see that formula is, is exactly what gives you this covariant induction. Uh, this, this defines a uh, homomorphism of path options. And this is just an obvious calculation. There's nothing to it. Also, it's completely obvious that the injectivity condition defines a subcategory because, of course, identity is injective, and of course, combining injective maps with injective maps is injective. Okay, so if something was injected, well, I I cheat a little bit because it's injected on vertices. But you see, we have this assumption that vertices go on into vertices. So if, if I have a map mapping, mapping vertices to vertices, which is injective on vertices, then then combining them 
is a map which again maps vertices to vertices which is checked with so, so when this is a subcategory and when this induces the uh, covariant layer of a homomorphism of our algebra it's a reality okay now it's much more fun and that's exactly what we are going to do as as a pro and now when you have the deep two conditions satisfied for both c1 and c2 so not only any injective on vertices but you also have this m condition satisfied this implication conditions satisfied then first uh, you can prove that uh, this uh, second condition determines the subcategory in, in IPG. Yeah, you can you can do it, but it requires a proof as well. Yes. And and secondly, that when these two conditions are satisfied, then the same recipe, but not going to the quotient, right? I'm using the same recipe, but now first I have to look at the extended graphs, okay? And 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 then I uh, have to do, do it on the quotients, but it's exactly the same recipe, but sort of first extended and then quotiented. Uh, and then the same recipe gives you a well-defined homomorphism of compact algebras. Okay, and we're going to prove it. And finally, when all three conditions are satisfied, then well, the same formula, but now this quotient is the Levitt quotient. So here is the Levitt quotient. Here is the con quotient. So here you divide by both constraint relations. Here you by one. Um, when you divide by both, uh, and we have three conditions satisfied, and yes, indeed, uh, you can claim that uh, this assignment defines a covariant functor from path homomorphism of graphs, satisfying the three conditions, uh, to uh, homomorphism of Levitt path algebras. And, and here's just the notation, uh, which I'm going to explore in, in the next slide. Uh, then this f bar is the obvious extension of f. Okay, and and uh, I'm, but actually I'll spell down in the next time. Okay, and now we really start. This is where my talk begins. Okay, everything else I, I told you until now was done before, was present in other talks. My talk really begins right now, and I have uh, I have less than forty minutes to do it. But okay, let's uh, speed it up a little bit. This is the take home, but the only result, this is the take home result of the main result. So I take uh, the directed graph together with half homomorphism satisfying the three covariant conditions. And first, I prove that they form a subcategory in the category of graphs and all graphs. Okay. We call this uh, subcategory R M I P G, so regular monotonic injective, half homomorphism for the graphs. Okay. Moreover, when I look at these assignments, which are all this spelled out, okay, uh, I, I first, well, to every graph, I assign its graph sister algebra, okay? Uh, secondly, to every, every such a morphism of graphs, so, so I, I take the morphism in this category, okay? I have the same recipe as for Levitt graph algebras, and I know that it's an abuse of notation, but uh, every homomorphism between Levitt graph algebras uh, induces automatically a uh, star homomorphism between the universal graph sister algebras because of the universal. Okay? So the main claim is that this assignment really, these assignments really define a covariant factor into the category of sister algebras and star homomorphisms. And now I'm answering again your question about unitality. Okay? If you now uh, assume, but you have to assume a little bit more. The, 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 the strong assumption you make is that now you are not only injective on vertices, you are bijective on vertices. So now, because your graphs have only uh, finitely many vertices, this is a bijection between two finite sets. Completely. Uh, that's exactly what you need. Okay? So, 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 so now, basically, yeah, I mean, you not only further restrict the morphism because injectivity turns out to be bijectivity, but you also restrict your graphs, the graphs which are finitely many. But then it's exactly as you want. When you do such a restriction, then you restrict here this functor to a functor which goes from the sub subcategory, this RM PBG, and that's easy to check that it's subcategory. It's again bijections composed of bijections. Mm -hmm. uh, and and um, uh, you, you, you can then, then check that, that this covariant induction gives you actually a unit of star homomorphism between systems. Okay. So that's the main result. This is as uh, general as I could get. And uh, let's do the proof. Does the invariant conditions imply homomorphism? This is always proper. 
Okay, on uh, on the graphs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, let's go back to his conditions. Well, on on wait one more. Slide. Well, yeah, more than proper about vertices because yeah, injective or adjective. Uh, when it comes to gluing, when it comes to gluing edges, this condition doesn't tell you anything. Um, I don't think it has to be proper. In fact, this is this is this is a, a, a good question. You, you, might, you of course you want to preserve your regular uh, vertices, but. Uh, um, you, you you can have an infinite diameter, and then you can say collapse every second edge to one edge, and the rain the others remain. So you don't violate the regularity uh, condition, and it's not finite to one. So so I I uh, it would have to be really checked uh, carefully with everything holds, but I don't see uh, this has nothing to do with edges. Uh, well, this has to do with edges, but it's about extensions of paths. So, by for instance, I might have no paths except for length one. Okay, so so I, I maybe this would be a, a good example. I have say an infinite meter. I have countably infinitely many coming here. I have countably infinitely many coming there. And say I collapse to something like this, but I have just one edge here. And countably infinitely many here. I, I don't see a violation of any of this. Uh, we don't have to care about C3 since there are no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> C3 is void because there is no regular vertex. Uh, uh, there is nothing to, in terms of extensions of path because the only paths are of length one. Vertices are mapped to vertices, so nothing here is violated. Uh, injectivity of vertices is fine. So I believe that's an example uh, where it's not like that. Yeah, seems good. Yeah, seems good. I mean, I, I'm always hesitant to claim such things during a talk, but uh, I don't see any, any error here. But it was a very good question. Okay, so we go into the proof and we will do it systematically. So for starters, directed graph to get the path from a morbid to the injective. Uh, when you stick it to the set of vertices, they clearly form a character. I would mention that's trivial. We know the scatter by G, and then again, it's very easy to check that uh, F star gives you uh, a covariant function from I to G to the category of algebra. It's half algebra constraint. It's trivial. There's nothing to, to it's just a trivial exercise. Okay. But now, when we go to the extended graph, well, this lemma is again trivial, but I thought of spelling it out because that's an essential thing. That's a step you cannot overlook. We have this construction of extended graphs, and I, I find it nice to put it in the categorical terms. So uh, I take uh, my, my category of graphs, and I take this construction of extended graphs, and I claim that this construction is factorial. That's it. Okay. Uh, uh, and now that is obvious. You remember, some time ago, I wrote that F bar is the obvious extension of F to the extended graph. Well. It is really obvious because F bar on vertices is the same as F. F bar on uh, the usual edges is the same as F. And F bar on the ghost edge is the ghost edge of F of this uh, edge. So, so F bar of E star is by definition F of E star. Of course, these are starting homomorphisms to be. So that's uh, how we define it. Okay. And then, then, then when you go to pass, uh, you, you have you have a path in your extended graph. So so some of these axes can be actual ghost edges. There's nothing wrong with it. But then you know what to do with an edge, ghost or not. And because uh, because still you can you can check that f uh, because f preserves the endpoint and the start point. So that's a bar. This can be immediately checked. Okay. And this way you you define a path homomorphism uh, between the extended graphs. Okay, and I claim this is very easy to verify that this assignment, uh, which takes a graph to the extended graph and which takes a morphism 
uh, path, uh, path uh, homomorphism of graphs into this extended path homomorphism of graphs, where the yields a uh, covariant functor to the category. Uh, this is an endofunctor of the category of um, uh, graphs and path homomorphism of graphs. Okay. And, and uh, furthermore, if you restrict this end of factor to the, to, you can restrict this end of factor to the subcategory of IPG. Because again, it's always that if F is injective on vertices, then so is L. I mean, they are the same on vertices. Okay. They have an end of factor of PG, which restricts an end of factor of, of IPG. So this is already cool because now I know that whenever I have uh, an IPG morphisms from, from E to F, this induces an algebra homomorphism from the path algebra of the extended graph to the path algebra of the extended graph. You have such a factor by combining this uh, of this observation and this lemma. I mean, this lemma is also easy to progress in order. Okay, and now we finally something a little bit fun in, in the remaining uh, half an hour. Uh, first, I want to prove that indeed restricting uh, the category IPG by the second covariant condition C2 gives me a subcategory. Okay, so one of the things I have to check, you know, like you know, that the composition of continuous function is a continuous function, I have to check that, that if I assume now, if I assume now that both F and G satisfy C2, okay, then F composed with G also satisfy C2. And I want to prove it because the proof is actually, well, I mean, oh, everything here is easy, but uh, at least it's not real. Okay, so I, I assume that F and G satisfy C2. And of course, I also assume that the decomposed with F it is extended to, to, to the, that G of F of E is extended by G of F of E. And now what we want to prove is that E is equal to E. Okay, this is what we want to prove. Okay, and now we have to consider like three special cases. Well, first special case we have to consider is what happens if E is F of E is a vertex. It can happen. Right? We, we, we don't have to increase, the, we can map edges uh, uh, to longer paths, but we can also map edges to vertices. This is a natural map, and a natural thing to consider. So assume that, that uh, F E is a vertex. Then, of course, G of F E is also a vertex because vertices are F to vertices. Okay, but if G of F E is a vertex, and then when you look at it as a path, well, it's equal to the beginning of this path, okay? But now remember that these path homomorphisms respect the beginnings of paths. So, so, so uh, SGG is the same as GSF, okay? And, and, now, and now, by the fact that we are injective on vertices, you can conclude that F of V is the same as, as F of F of V prime, which means that f of e is uh, well, okay. Uh, oops, and here's a typo. I I I need a, I need one more parenthesis. Okay, but consequently, uh, you, you you can you can now conclude because you see this is the beginning of e prime. Okay, so if f e is a vertex, vertex which is at the beginning of of f of e prime, then obviously f of e prime extends its starting vertex. So this is satisfied. But if this is satisfied, then E is equal to E prime, which we want. So first case done. Much in the same way, now if you assume that F of E prime is a vertex, well, then uh, also G of F e is a vertex. Why? Because if F of E prime is a vertex, then G of F of E prime is a vertex, and then G of F e is also. Then in fact, these two vertices. So I'm writing G of F, G of, uh, F e prime is equal to G of F e, uh, but now it's just the beginning of G of F e, uh, and now by, by the fact that the beings are preserved by path homomorphism of graphs, this is the same as GSF of F E. And again, I'm using uh, the injectivity on vertices to conclude that F of E prime is equal to SF of F of E, okay? F of E prime is equal to F of E by this vertex injectivity. But, but now we can conclude that it is F E which extends uh, F E prime. So again, F F E equal to E prime. And now there's the last part you have to check. Well, what happens if they are both positive length? Okay. So assume next that uh, f of e is some path e1 to em, and f of e prime is some path from e1 prime to e prime, where all these e's prime and prime are edges. Okay. Well, uh, then uh, this condition, uh, which we assume, 
this one, but g of f of e is extended to g of f of e prime. Well, it means that uh, g of e1 uh, composed up to g of n is extended to g of e1 prime composed up to g of e n prime. Okay, and just substitution. But well, you have to. Offer. I look at g of e1 and I look at of uh, g e1 prime. I mean, they of course start at the same values. Okay. And here I have two options. Either it is G of E1 prime, which extends G of E1, or the other way around. Right? That's shown by, by this condition. Okay. But uh, in whichever case we have, because G satisfies C2 condition, we can conclude that, that E1 is equal to E1 prime. Well, but if E1 is equal to E1 prime, and of course G of E1 is equal to G of E1 prime, and this extension property can be reduced by removing the first subpath. Okay. So that we have that G of E2 up to G of EM is extended to G of E2 prime up to G of uh, EN prime. And you can iterate this argument to finally conclude that you have EI equal to EI prime for all I's which range from one to the minimum between M and N. You don't know which is bigger, so you take the minimum, okay? But this means that you either have F of E prime extending F of E or F of E extending F of, 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 of E prime. And now because F satisfies C2, you have E is equal to E prime, okay? So that's, uh, I don't know, I think how like this argument. Of course it's easy, but it's non-trivial. You have to sweat a little bit. So summarizing we have shown this red equation, this red unification holds, and then finally, uh, since identity obviously satisfies uh, C2, okay, if I if I have uh, a identity here, well, if E, uh, if an edge is extended to an edge prime, the only way one edge extends the other edge is they are equal. So this identity satisfies the implication. So we have a subcategory. Good. Now let's do the calculation for compact algebras to see that the first configured relations are preserved, okay? So now we take a morphism satisfying C1 and C2, so a morphism with this MIPG uh, category, actually we prove that it's a category, that's what we just proved. And now for starters, we assume that F of E is of positive length. So I can write F of E as some sequence of edges F1 to Fn, okay? And now we do the following calculation in the compass algebra of the graph F. Okay, so I take uh, this, you, you, you see that, that um, has been defined. Uh, I, I know F is uh, a morphism from E to F. So F bar is a morphism from E bar to F bar, okay? Uh, so F bar star is a morphism from, so maybe I should write it down because it's too many words. Now even this is slow. Um, so maybe it's worth reminding you that when I write f bar star, okay, this is this is now a, an algebra homomorphism going from the extent the path algebra of the extended graph E bar. That's so the fun. only choice on the algebraic level. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. 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 Let me spell it out so you know the domains and counting domains. I'm so sorry, but it's so slow. To K of F bar. So I already know that it's a covariant factor. Okay. So writing all of this makes sense. I take the quotient in the compound, right? And I calculate. Well, so for starters, by, by the very definition, uh, you know that uh, F bar star of chi U chi star, well, uh, what, what do I do? I um, First, I multiply it in the path algebra. So in the path algebra, it, chi star chi e is just, uh, uh, I'm skipping a step, chi star chi e is chi e star e, okay? Then, then by definition of this factor, it will be a chi of f bar of e star e, all right? And, and, and now, of course, I, I, the, that calculation is done uh, inside the square bracket. You don't need to be in the compact algebra to do it. Okay. Now the next step. Uh, well, you 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 remember what is uh, what is f bar of e star e? That's exactly f of e star times f e. 
and 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 chi of f star f e star f e is chi of f e star times chi of e, and now of course you can uh, put these uh, square brackets outside because the, the, the quotient multiplication is just the quotient multiplication. Uh, so so the, the the equivalence class of uh, these guys multiplying the path algebra is multiplication of the equivalence classes of these elements. And now you spell out exactly what these guys are. So you have this uh, f of e written down here in terms of these edges. We assume to be this to be of positive length, okay? And uh, this will come down to that formula, okay? Basically, and, everything cancels uh, pairs by pair from inside the chain. Exactly. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So when when you look uh, when you look uh, over here, right? And now this is important that I'm writing it in contact algebra because because these loops that we discovered these loops in path algebra do not collapse, but they do collapse in contact algebra. So this is exactly shrinking the loops we discussed earlier to a vertex. Okay. And of course, uh, when I think it's a vertex, which vertex is this is the endpoint of of. Uh, uh, this is the end point of f of one, but the end point of f of one is the beginning of f two. So this is absorbed by the path algebra relation. Okay, so this just vanishes. Yeah, it multiplies itself out. Is the t it multiplies itself out to this chi t f of f one, but but t of f of f one is the beginning is uh, of f two. So by path algebra relation, this just vanishes, and 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 I'm left with uh, one item less. F one is now gone. And I repeat it uh, all the way until I, I end it with chi of tf of the right? By, by, by trivial induction. But and then, of course, this is exactly the same as having f bar star applied to chi of t of e, right? Because, uh, because uh, uh, t, t, first, uh, what, what do we have? Um, Maybe I should spell it out. So, <clears throat> well, I will have here, uh, if I want to conclude what I have, I will have here chi of what? Of f bar applied to te of e. Okay, but uh, remember that, that these path homomorphisms preserve the ends. So uh, f bar of t of e is the same as tf of f bar of e, but f bar of e is just uh, f of e, and f of e is uh, this path, and at the end of this path is just the end of event. And that's exactly what is written here. Okay, so you have this equality. And uh, please uh, observe that uh, if, if, in case Fe is a vertex, the above calculation is simply trivial. Uh, I mean, that's, uh, uh, you, you immediately have that E star is equal to E and chi E, chi e is equal to chi E. Uh, so basically you end up with, uh, here it's just F, F uh, bar star of chi E. And, uh, and, uh, and 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 here the end point of the vertex. Uh, sorry, you 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 have it here. Uh, that's uh, this this at the end will be just a vertex. The end of this vertex is vertex, and this equality holds. Okay, so just folks, trivially, you don't need to do any compact algebra. I believe that's just completely trivial. Okay, this calculation is trivial when you have a vertex. And now, sort of the most uh, interesting part. Um, what happens? What happens if you have these two edges, which are different, right? Because remember, when you go to the first configure relation, I will go back. Okay. Here it is. Well, I mean, you, you, you not only have to have to prove what happens when E is equal to F, we, we just did, okay? 
But you also have to prove that if E is distinct from F, then these guys multiply to zero. Okay. So that's that's what we are doing right now. And that's also fun. Yes, okay. So, so now we assume that E and E prime are different, but they begin at the same vertex, okay? So then by, by uh, C2, we know that neither F, F of E prime extends F of E, nor F of E extends F of E prime, okay? Because if they did, this edge would have to be equal, okay? Now I also claim that uh, neither F E nor F E prime can be vertex in C, let's see one. So indeed, suppose that F E is a vertex. Well, if F E is a vertex, then F of E is equal to its beginning. But now because the beginnings are preserved, S F of F is the same as F of uh, S E, okay? But S E is of E is the same as S E of E prime. And now uh, f of s e of e prime is the same as s f of f of e prime. Okay. So what what we just proved is that f e is the starting vertex of f of e prime. So f e prime uh, extends f e, which is a contradiction. Okay. So and, and the path f e prime cannot be a vertex by a completely symmetric argument. It doesn't make sense to repeat it. It's, it's exactly the same story. All right. So now we know that uh, F E and F E prime cannot be vertices. All right. So consequently, uh, they are paths of positive length, and we write F of E as uh, the path uh, made out of edges uh, F1 to Fn, and F E prime as the path made from the edges F1 prime to F n prime, F prime n prime. Okay. So now the conditions that neither F E prime extends F E nor F E extends F E prime implies that there exists an index I, which is less than equal than the minimal uh, of N N prime, such that uh, F I is different from F I prime. These two edges are, are different. Okay? Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, uh, one would be an extension of the other. The first index. That the first index at which they differ. Yes. Right, that's exactly what we are doing. But now I can prove that uh, when I do this calculation, this multiplies uh, to zero. Why? Well, let's do it very much as before. Uh, F bar star of chi e star chi e prime is exactly the same as uh, chi. So here, this square bracket is irrelevant. It all happens at the level of path algebra. This is the same as chi of F bar e star uh, e prime. Okay. Um, but uh, what did I? I think yeah. in, in the last one, we should, should be, instead of F1, it should be F i, right? It should be chi of F i star. No, 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 I will explain. No, 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 that, that's correct. But I, I, I will explain. Just give me a second. Um, and, and here we, we know that F bar of, uh, of uh, E star E prime will be F E star F E prime, then you split it into a multiplication, then we write out explicitly what is F of E, what is F of E prime. So now the difference is that here is E prime, here is E. It's very much as before, but, but now we have here uh, Fs and here we have F primes. Here we range from 1 to N, here range from 1 to N prime. But, but exactly as before, remember, this is uh, as before. But there exists an index, maybe I should write uh, 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 that this is the first index at which they differ. That's exactly what I have in mind. Everything in the end is cancelled out until I. Exactly. Zero. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yes. So, so for as long as, as these guys are the same, they will just vanish as in the previous calculation. I mean, vanish without giving zero. So I'll be able to, to, to make it shorter and shorter and shorter. But at the end of the day, unavoidably, I'll bump into this index time. And I'll have to have here F. So yes, so you can say that maybe it would be more pedagogical. I mean, both are correct, right? But maybe it would be more pedagogical to write I here and I there, right? That is obvious it's zero. And, 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 and then this is, this is obviously zero because it's zero by the Kuhn-Springer cool relation. Okay. So, so now you really have to multiply in the concave algebra to get zero. But we multiply in concave algebra and we get zero, okay? 
So, so now we also have this relation satisfied if, uh, if we have p different from the prime. And just one quick observation. Well, here we have this assumption, so it will be completely legitimate for you to ask. So what happens if S of E is not equal to S of uh, if, What if the beginning of E is not the beginning of the prime? Well, then, then the buff calculation is trivial because we have zero already here, right? I mean, in path algebra, these guys multiply to zero if the end of the prime is not the, if the end of E is not the beginning of the prime. But the end of E bar E star is the beginning of E. So if the beginning of this week of the beginning of the prime, that's only zero in the path of yeah, before you apply it. Before you do anything. You know? so, so that's to be a satisfied. But uh, now we are completely cool. I mean, we see that uh, all of this works in the concave algebra. And now this is the final step and uh, the final slide. What happens at the level of Krasnitz algebra? So summarizing what we just proved is uh, that when you take this um, functor, I mean, when you take this construction at the level of concave algebras, it yields a well-defined algebra on okay. Because, well, I, uh, maybe I should have mentioned it, but, that one of the ways of- It also preserve the star, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we will, the stars are up, up, up. But you see, at this moment, I'm over an arbitrary field. So I'm not- Telling when these are star homomorphism. These are just algebras of a K, so there's no star. Okay. These are just, just a notation, suggestive notation for, for extended graph, right? Uh, well, the, the way I, I defined the, the path algebras, one path algebra, levy path algebras, I started from a vector space and I endowed the vector space of multiplication and I baptized it as the path algebra. And then I did uh, two quotients, first the quotient to the Kohn-Pav algebra, the quotient to the Levitt-Pav algebra. But equivalently, you can think about the path algebra as uh, the universal algebra given by generative relations. Your generators uh, uh, are, are given by size labeled by vertices and edges. That's it. Okay. And then you can easily cook up the relations and you can convince yourself that the universal algebra for the generative relations is exactly the path algebra as I defined. Okay. So, so then, then the same goes about con path algebras and levy path algebras. Because again, you can say, all right, now I take the extended graphs. I take, uh, uh, I take ties labeled by vertices and by edges of the extended graph. These are my generators. I, I put in all these relations. Okay. And you can think about these guys as algebras given by generators. All right. So, so, so that's why, from this perspective, once I'm done with such a calculation, I prove that I have a well defined uh, homomorphism because, because basically what we just calculated here is, is that the first constructed relation is satisfied. So that, so that the obvious uh, way uh, I define it, I define my map on generators. Okay. And if this defining on generators is done in such a way that the relations are satisfied, then of course I I, I immediately uh, know that this is the same as uh, since the generator in your ideal to the exactly. Yeah. So, so so I can now write it down as uh, f star. I mean f bar star of chi e times f bar star. Oh, guy. Uh, it's so frustrating. Uh, of E prime. Okay, because my algebra is defined as universal algebra given by relations, I just have to give you a recipe on generators. Okay, I have to prove that this recipe preserves the ideals, and then it's automatically homomorphic. So, so this equality is by construction. Okay. All right, and the, the, the final. Uh, so, so summarizing, we can infer that this construction gives me a well-defined uh, algebra homomorphism between concave algebras. And now, of course, we have to take care about the second constructor relation. Uh, which is spelled out exactly here. All right. At the regular vertex, you must have the satisfied. This is why you need the third covariance. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And while it, it takes again, like, you know, four pages to prove everything, that is indeed a subcategory and then you need the 
this is this calculation holds that's kind of automatic I and mean, you don't need to do anything you, you just plug it in and you invent the correct notation and uh, slide down the hill it's lengthy but sort of algorithmic right that's why i decided not to talk about it i decided to talk about m instead of r but but exactly uh, as you say now restricting myself being further so adding the third uh, covariant condition the c3 condition now and then in regular vertex you can actually compute just as we did it before in the levit algebra you can compute that this equality holds and when you compute that the equality holds it's obvious that uh, this f star l as defined in the theorem gives me a well-defined algebra homomorphism okay as explained before in the setting of compound algebra. And now, please note, because the graph sister algebras are defined as the universal sister algebras of the Levitt algebra. It's also functorial. This is also functorial, and also you have this extension. But before functoriality, we, we have a, that you have this automatic uh, extension, right? Maybe it's, it's, it's worth uh, writing it down. I have a map uh, uh, from LKE to uh, LKS. So, okay, now we have our complex numbers. Uh, well, first, first one. Okay, there, there is uh, there is one thing which should be spelled out, uh, but we only discussed it. Why is it really a graph, uh, a star homomorphism? Okay, so now let's take the ground fields to be complex numbers. Okay, and uh, now let's uh, look at this lemma. This is why this is why I spelled it out. You know, know it's trivial. I spelled it out say, in the form of a lemma. You see, the way these things are defined. If you define the star structure, I don't want to flip it all the way back. But remember how we defined the star structure uh, in the levit algebra of the complex numbers. So remembering the, the star structure in the levit algebra of the complex numbers, you immediately see that uh, when you look at this definition. You see that you have a star homomorphism. Okay. So, so, so this lemma sort of guarantees that all this construction gives you a star homomorphism. Okay. Oops. So when I said which extends automatically to to uh, to the level of Grassy Star, first. I have a step in between that for k equals c, uh, this homomorphism in fact is, is a star homomorphism of algebras. Okay. And now I have a star homomorphism of algebras. So I let me write here L C for complex numbers of E going to L C of F. It should be seen. Okay. That's a star subalgebra in here, which is dense. That's a star subalgebra in here, which is dense. So I can go from LCE to LCF and then include it in C star of F. But because that's the universal C star algebra of, of this algebra, um, this will be continuous. So this will extend to the complex. So, so it's automatic that, that the star homomorphism here, and this is a star homomorphism there. Okay. And functoriality is really obvious because, uh, well, uh, this is what you want to have is that you have F composed G, and then, then you star and L it, that this is S star L composed with G L star, but it follows immediately uh, from this factoriality equation over here, right? And this at the level of extended graphs. Remember, we 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 uh, we already concluded it that um, we have a covariant functor going from uh, going from uh, graphs uh, with injective uh, that I have with path homomorphs that injective on vertices to path algebras of the extended graphs. Well, this got earlier, but it's clearly a trivial functor. So this is satisfied, and and then when you just decorate the value, it means that you put it into the quotient, right? So if this is preserved before you go into the quotient, it will be preserved after you go. So functoriality is obvious. 
And again, coming back to, to your question at, at the very end, the unitelic vector chain follows immediately from the fact that you can prove that a nice exercise is not completely obvious, that one is just the sum over all vertices of probably the largest of projections. Exactly, yes. You add all vertex projections, and that you can prove that the, it's the unit of your uh, sister algebra. Okay. And it's completely obvious that when you assume that you are bijected on vertices, Okay, if you apply some F to it. You apply some F to it, you go inside. Well, so now you'll, you'll have a sum that over vertices at zero, but it's a bijection. So, so nothing will be lost. And then you will you know, you'll, uh, add up chi F of these, but F of D will be all, all uh, vertices in your graph. And this will be one, but this time in the system. So the entirety is preserved. Okay. And I think that this uh, ends my talk. I really thank you for your patience. I just want to go back to this main theorem because I want you somehow to remember it. This is the take from uh, thing. In, in a very systematic manner, we construct this category RMIPG and we prove that we have a covariant factor from this category into the category of sister algebras. Okay. And this is way more general than what we used uh, in the previous setting, like for instance with Tobolsky and Pasito. Um, and maybe let me end, uh, this is a remark I should have made earlier, but let me do it right now. Uh, I'm talking about, I want to explain why uh, I'm uh, so attached to the C2 condition. Okay, you see, um, consider the following situation. And this is a completely legitimate situation. I have one graph, which is just uh, one loop. And I have another graph, which is just one vertex. So basically what I'm doing, I'm mapping this vertex V to this vertex W, and I'm mapping this edge E on all paths. You know, I'm mapping to this vertex W. So I'm sim simply collapsing this graph to the top, okay? But you, you, can, you can look at what it is. That's the sister algebra of functions on the circle. And you simply take the evaluation map at one, that's the unit circle on the complex plane. So one is uh, on the circle. And that's the evaluation at one, which goes to complex numbers. I mean, this is a perfectly well defined star of okay? That's just the evaluation map. And it's given exactly by this, uh, by the uh, covariant induction from this model of graphs. Okay, so I'm sending a loop into 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 a vertex. Okay, and you can see that that as long as long as I'm talking here edges, I'm I'm done. That's okay. This is satisfying. But imagine that that I, I put paths in here instead of as we did it with Tobolsky and Kankilvasito. And then, then here it's, it's, it's violated because obviously uh, you, you have that, uh, uh, well, W extends W. Okay, so, 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 so you, you, you obviously have, uh, and, and you can write this, uh, this W as uh, uh, F of E, and you can write this W as F of D. So by this condition, you oh, again, it stopped writing. So by this condition, you would need to have that, that E is equal to V, but that's not true. The edge is not a, not a vertex. Okay. So, 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 so having that implication, probably past is wrong. I mean, it cut out an, an extremely natural uh, start of the morphism, which is induced covariantly from morphism of graphs. Okay. We didn't need it in our work with Marius and, uh, and uh, Alex, but uh, when I was trying to systematically, I realized, no, I mean, we, we can weaken this condition to accommodate such uh, examples. And I think it's time to end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Piotr. Uh, are there questions? I have a very general question. 
please, please, Adam. Uh, so, uh, is there any general method uh, for introducing some kind of uh, Dirac operators on these path algebras to get the spectral triple finally? Well, this is not a very well posed question. Path algebras are completely algebraic. You can forget an analysis at this level. You, 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 well, your question is meaningful at the level of graph sister algebras. And yes, for graph sister algebras, you have some works of uh, uh, people like Rennie and, and uh, other guys in the DOM uh, about how to do spectral triples on graph sister algebras. But, but, but when you do spectral triples, you must have a sister algebra. At the level of path algebra, it's, it's, it's too general. Yeah. You know, path algebra is like the test of algebra. It's like this completely, it's like something, you know, contractible. It's some huge Euclidean space in which you put into something. It's like polynomials, yes. Yes, yes, yes. And and, and it makes no sense uh, here to, to talk about any completions and so on and so forth. So but, could you please repeat those names? Uh, people, people. In, the world, in Australia, so people like Adam Rennie, David Pass, Aiden Sims. Who was talking about it uh, uh, during our uh, kickoff conference? Somebody was definitely talking. About it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember which talk it was, but uh, it must have been. Well, it was. It was uh, either. Uh, there are two options. So it was one of the last two talks on Tuesday. So it was either Bram Mesland or David Kidd. Okay, thank you. Sure. Tom, I don't see people. You don't see people, maybe. Other the... questions? If there are no other questions, uh, may I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, if you have. If you have uh, two graphs and you have a map, which is finite to one, which is what? finite to one, finite to one, proper. Yes. Okay. And then uh, you have maps uh, which are of finite support. <laughs> Okay, then the pullback of this of this mat mm -hmm. uh, from from to C. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are functions. Mm -hmm. the, the pullback uh, maps these functions to that. Uh, you have an identification of these with finite linear combinations of E identifying identifying. Uh, let's say. Uh, Dirac measures with with uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Function, function of one point. Uh... That's the contravariant factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so my question is, uh, uh, yes, of course. It, 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 if you compose this in this way, you, you obtain a contravariant factor. Uh, uh, is this is there some relation between this uh, covariant and co contravariant version and this identification? I'm not aware of any useful relation, no. Mm -hmm. okay. these, are, these are totally <laughs> different animals. And one of the things uh, that you can immediately spot, uh, here you, you, would, you would be able to do nothing without properness. But being finite to one, this just doesn't work. And as, as with Puas, how we decided in our covariant way, there's no problem. We can be infinite to one. We need not be proper, and we still need this uh, nice. Uh, Start on amorphism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a question on chat which I just read. It doesn't C two yes. uh, imply injectivity on edges? No, we already answered it. By no means, C two by no means implies injectivity on edges. Absolutely not. Absolutely not, because because you see, uh, uh, that's not the equality. Okay. You would have you would have injectivity if you are have a high. These guys are equal, then these are that's injectivity, right? But I'm I'm having less or equal, so this is much weaker condition. Okay, okay. it's it's uh... ah okay. I see. Uh, I I I saw. So, I'm sorry. I see the reasoning. Okay, I see. Oh, I'm sorry. So so uh, let me let me do it more carefully. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Of course, if I have f of e, yes. If I have f of e, 
equal to f of e prime Well, that it does imply that f of e prime uh, extends uh, f of e. Wow, so wait a second. So, so wait, so something is wrong. Wow, help me. Uh, so what was wrong with our example? Uh, ah, okay, yes, I know. I know why, why we have it, okay? So there is no mistake. Because the implication is true if the hypothesis implication is always false. And the example which we just drew, this was never satisfied. This was never satisfied. And when it was satisfied, it was okay. But, but somehow the, this, this uh, that doesn't, doesn't work that way um, because uh, the, the example which we drew before is, is completely uh, legitimate, right? And, and you, you still can have, uh, can have this uh, collapse, yeah. Yeah, so somehow it's subtle. This is a very good question, but but the answer is no. Uh, C does not imply the objectivity, and 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 there is uh, there is no no contradiction because uh, because whenever I have that uh, uh, f uh, f of e um, is wait, wait, wait a second. Uh, no, I, I I got a little bit convoluted here. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, George. Could you could you uh, write down this example again? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I think well, I think we might have been wrong after all. Yeah. So so let's uh, let's uh, do it again. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Oh no! This is so frustrating. Maybe I can just escape it like this. Okay. Okay, so wait a second. So, Yeah, I think the answer is yes. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm, as I warned you, I'm a zombie because I hardly slept. Uh, if the guys are equal, then of course one extends the other. So it seems, no, no, that, that uh, you cannot just fudge around the obvious implications. It's definitely hold. So the first implication is obvious. And of course, you can compose implication, but that's precisely the condition for for injectivity. So yes, yes, you are right. Our condition was uh, our example was wrong, and uh, let me uh, let me say say why. Because uh, whenever you identify two edges, okay, I do this collapse and I collapse it in here. You can't identify. Then, then, then of course, this edge extends this edge, and these guys are different. So that's wrong. That's wrong. However, it still not have to be proper. But but, but the thing that, that we can do is uh, uh, how about uh, mm, uh, I was wondering if you can take oh, but this would be all infinity and all infinity has no evaluation. Um, I was thinking about collapsing infinitely many loops, or maybe okay, okay, okay. So how about how about uh, what about if you take e to be a, a loop straight line with uh, infinitely many vertices? Okay, and you take f to be just a segment, and you map for every path in e that is at least of length to to this edge. And it's not proper. I think it's still a little bit much, right? 
You know, remember, you have to be injected on vertices and vertices uh, and the ends and the knees of paths are preserved. So that's not so, uh, it's, it's, it's not so easy. This is why I was thinking about uh, the loops in order not to have problems in, with the injectivity on, on, on vertices. So yes, definitely this implies injectivity of edges. No doubt about that. Um, but uh, uh, whether I have is proper. But if, but, but if I have properness that, I mean, obviously you have no injectivity, right? I mean, the example that I gave as a moderate example obviously tells you that you have no injectivity. But, but wait a second. No, no, no. No, no. That's, that, that, this example already shows you that it's not proper. Why? Because not only I collapse this edge, this loop to a point, I collapse all loops of all lengths. Mm -hmm. So here, I, my, my, because I have a loop, my set of finite paths is infinite. So it's definitely not proper. This example also shows that this is not proper. It's not a legitimate, right? hmm? it's not a legitimate, legitimate uh, morphism in your category. Uh, this I explained. This, is, this was a machination. Yeah, basically every path in here goes to this point. And it's a legitimate, this is definitely legitimate. We all satisfy all axes. Ah, okay. Yeah, yes. and it's definitely not. You, you, you see, if I, you are still injective on edges, <laughs> there are no edges here. Right? And so, so, so uh, uh, yeah, I mean, um, Well, okay. Uh, let, let, yeah, you 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 are injective of edges because you have only one edge. Okay, so so you cannot glue two edges because there's just one edge. So we are injective on edges. There's no contradiction. But you are not proper because you can go by e once, you can go by e twice. So 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 you have e n is always mapped to the vertex e. So that's not finite one. Okay, okay. So thank you so much for this question on on, on chat. Yes, yes, thank you so much. Oh, wait a second, there's again something on chat. Oh, thank you, right. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Very good. Uh, other questions? I still have one. Comment? Who oh, has a question? As, as your last example shows, and it's something very weird. Uh, I thought it's the final object in your category, right? And it corresponds to the theta algebra C. Yes. And so if you do have this covariant functor construction, that actually means every graph theta algebra you obtain has a character, no. which is given by no isomorphism to receive right no but but uh, but, but there is uh, i i don't and then it's very strong you no 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 but but uh, what you said is wrong uh I, that, that's what you can do in a sense already when i have another loop okay uh it's impossible because imagine that i have e and d prime so like the Kuntz algebra o2 okay this doesn't exist. This condition is not satisfied because now I have two different edges which I map into one vertex, and that's not allowed. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. And of course, this is O2 sister algebra of Kuntz. So actually, it's it simple. So there is no character. Not, not the final object. No. I have a more basic question. Uh -huh. And does the covariant functor you constructed is faithful in the sense that? Uh, can it happen that the two different morphisms in your category, uh, R and my TG, uh -huh. starting with the same the same graph, ending with the same graph, these are two different morphisms. Uh -huh. and the algebra that would give the same homomorphism of theta algebra. Well, uh, I think the answer is yes. I think the answer is yes. And uh, and that when you call out something, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, exactly. And and, and let me give you uh, this example. So you remember this uh, one uh, thing extension of the uh, Kuhn's algebra O two. So here I have a minimal utilization of compact. So that's what I'm talking about, right? This part. Okay. And, and uh, 
And here I have just countable set. But here I can write an countable set in many different ways, right? It's entirely up to me how I order my countable set. And whichever way I order my countable set, as long as I'll have here some, some nice injection, so uh, some nth edge will be mapped into some nth path, but how I order this path is irrelevant. I, 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 I can do it in many different ways. And whichever way I do it, as long you know, as, as I have this principle that I, I, I wind around as widely as I want, but when I go out, I'm, I'm fine. All I have to do is construct here countably infinitely many different paths. And, and, and uh, maybe, uh, yeah, things, things like that. So, 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 so my, uh, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm not a peaceful part. No, 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 no. Also, you should, the, the, the faithfulness is already broken at the level of objects. I mean, you can have two different graphs which have exactly the same graph system algebra. So even at the level of objects, you definitely don't have faith. Faithful just means, uh, but okay. I know, I know, I know. Well, but 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 it's all. But it's important also to bear in mind objects, right? And then here you have two different uh, settings. Um, if uh, your two graphs are different in some small way, then not only the induced uh, graph is algebra is isomorphic; they are equivalent isomorphic with respect to the gauge action. But there are also cases in which you have two graphs that are uh, different in a stronger way, and the graph sister algebras are still isomorphic, but no longer as U1 sister algebras. So there's the whole yoga of how you uh, preserve the same sister algebra uh, with or without the gauge action. So I definitely have faithful of objects. And I'm, Probably I don't even I don't even need to I, I don't even need to go into Kuhn's. Maybe I could take just the Tetris graph. I mean, nobody tells me that the second edge should be uh, assigned to a loop and going out, and not two loops and going out. And then, then I mean, you can reorder it. When I take the powers of of this loop, I, I can order it in some funny way, and I bet that whichever way I order it, it will still be. Um, it will still be a star of a morphism because you see um, here there is uh, not, uh, but, it's, but you have to remember, you know, about this condition. So maybe I, 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 this has to be checked. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking aloud because uh, you should you should always remember about this extension uh, condition. So if you do things in some in some funny way, I mean, the higher power of a loop. Oh, no, no, wait a second, no. Here it's okay, because nothing is, is an extension of anything else. And this is because of going out. So whichever crazy path you have here, no path here is extension of the other path. And that's very important. All right. So basically it boils down to, I can map an edge to a loop winding itself several times. And since yeah. it corresponds to an item potent, I don't care about how I raise to which power. Yeah, they still give the same. Exactly. Time. Yeah. So, 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 so yeah, but, but because I worried for a second, uh, because when I just look at loops, higher powers of loops extend lower powers of loops, but, but no, look, you always have to go out. So, an extension would mean that you would follow from this point, but you cannot follow from this point because it's a same. Okay. So, so, so the only way in which I have f of e is extended by to f of e prime is when f of e is equal. So, so that's just. Uh, 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 that, that's uh, that, that should be absolutely no structure. And then actually, this is natural to understand. I mean, you can, uh, if you think about it as star morphs given transgenic relations, you, you can change it differently. And and you well, but okay. Uh, uh, the, 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 the question, okay, okay, sorry, sorry. The question is, uh, of course, in all these cases, you will get a star homomorphism between graph sister algebras, but will it be the same star homomorphism? Yes, that's my question. Uh, that's my question. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I was answering a different question, okay? Uh, you can have it before you yeah. ask to the quotient or to the Levita C algebra. It's in yeah, 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 yeah. 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 yeah, but but you see, uh, when you have oh, aha, okay, this is uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
because indeed you might, might have some even collapsing, and you might have some collapsing in a in a different way. Um, To be honest, it's not obvious to me. Okay. Uh, I, this is a this is an excellent this is an excellent question. Uh, they, they, this is indeed not obvious. I apologize again. I was answering the wrong question. You can have uh, many different uh, path homomorphisms of graphs, and all of them will induce star homomorphisms of graphs throughout. Okay. But they there will might be different star homomorphisms of graphs. It should be absolutely different. I mean, in this example, they should be different because uh, because I, I somehow there is a basis theorem, right? It's, there is a beautiful and difficult and complicated basis theorem which tells you which paths are sort of linear independent after their relations. Okay. And, and 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 then if you can show all right, I have uh, two different morphisms of graphs, but they actually uh, I have one and the same edge, and I assign two linear independent paths. So then it's obviously a different relation, and and and, and then you would have injectivity. But 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 it it, it, it might happen that uh, uh, you assign it to 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 one path and you assign it to to uh, or to assign it to another path, but these two paths will give you the same element in your level pathology. It's not obvious. To me. But you cannot do it. Yeah. So, so I don't even have a feeling if it's right or wrong. Okay. Yeah. But this is an excellent question. Okay. So I see no questions from the room. No questions. I have a no question. From the room. Not from the room. If I see. May I ask a question now? Sure. Okay. Uh, in Mario's uh, talk, of a question uh, whether uh, this uh, this functor transforms push outs into pullbacks of these algebras mm -hmm. yes it's an analog of kind of such a question uh, in this case for this covariant version uh, partially you know that's uh, as indicated in the sphere you see it's not exactly push out to pull back. <laughs> it's it, like on one hand side, we have these admissible subgraphs, and then we have these uh, covariant inductions in, for the other two morphisms. Okay? And we managed to cook up the conditions to guarantee that it's uh, a pullback theorem. So a pullback theorem, but not push out to pull back theorem. Because I cannot make, you see, when you look at these examples, but you know, serious. Some arrows, uh, the sense of some arrows are preserved, but some others are reversed. Exactly. So, so, so let me, okay, let me answer it, it, it is this way. This is my, my dream, but it has to be uh, fulfilled. What I would like to do, what I would like to do, I, I prefer contravariant functors to covariant functors. I, I, I'm in the spirit of Gelfand Neimark. I, I like compact the spaces mapping to the sister algebras. I'm, I'm just, the contravariant is so deeply ingrained in my brains uh, that uh, uh, I prefer it. So, so I'm very happy uh, with these directions of arrows, you know. This makes me very happy. Now, this makes me unhappy, okay? So what I really would like, I would like to uh, reverse these arrows. And somehow you, 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 you might have some idea uh, of how to do it. It's sort of why you can in, in, in reverse, invert it, because uh, at least in the examples we studied so far in here, uh, we were always injective. Okay? We only argue that you don't have to be injective, you don't even have to be proper. But, 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 but here in these examples, we're always injective. Okay? Uh, and and so, so this means that you can really reverse it on the image. Okay? You can reverse it on the image. So my problem is somehow with the domain. Uh, the, the inverse is not defined on, on all paths of this graph. So somehow, maybe like with the unbounded operators, you'll have to be able to say what is a morphism even if it's not defined on the whole uh, domain. And, and, and then uh, one of the things uh, uh, which are very nice, very, very nice indeed, when you look at this condition, um, where is it? This condition C2. Okay, but now imagine that you invert this F, but you have this, this uh, injective setting, 
and you forget about the full domain, you restrict it, and then you inject it, okay? Uh, so then basically this inequality over here uh, means uh, the continuity in the Alexandrov topology for the order given by the extension of paths. So that's, this would be beautiful because you would have morphisms uh, from spaces of path to spaces of path, which are continuous when you endow spaces of path with Alexandrov topology given by the order defined by extending paths. So, so that, that condition becomes a continuity condition, which I think is extremely important. I mean, at least at the level of paths, that's slightly more general. If I would put it to the level of paths, I mean, word F and, and read it again, but that's exactly the same when I'm monotonic. And monotonic means continuous in the Alexandrov topology. And the order, the partial order, is given by the extension of paths. So for me, this would be very, 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 very beautiful because, because not only that uh, now my construction is uh, contravariant all the way, but also the, the, these funny numorphs that are defined uh, have embedded the continuity condition. So that's uh, one of the directions of, of, of research. So that's my, my answer to it. Okay, thank you. Are the questions or comments at last? Not here. Not from here. Okay, so thank you, Piotr, very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you Let me stop recording. Thank you. I have to stop recording. Stop recording.